So I would say it's just part of our hardwiring. And I suspect that kids have been waking up in the night since the Paleolithic, um, seeing spirits of various descriptions. And I'm sure that when we launch our first spaceships off to Alpha Centauri, kids on board will be having the same experiences. And then everything goes haywire. And these kids start to see gnomes. And these gnomes are in cars. Um, and these cars are driving around and jumping over logs and going through this marshland. Welcome to the Spirit Box podcast, where we explore folklore, magic, the world of the spirits, and everything in between. For episode 97, we welcome Dr. Simon Young. Dr. Young is a British folklore historian based in Italy. He has written extensively on the 19th century supernatural. His book, The Boggart, from Exeter University Press, and the Nail in the Skull and other Victorian urban legends from Mississippi University Press are both out this year. Over the years, he's run courses on the history of Christianity, Italian food history, Italian media history, contemporary Italian history, World War II in Italy, and Italian Renaissance history. Well, what really interests me is Dr. Young has undertaken the biggest folklore survey of its kind ever undertaken on behalf of the Fairy Investigation Society. The society, which had its heyday in the 1920s and 30s, was an eccentric group that organised meetings, lectures and discussions for collecting evidence of fairy life. Dr. Young has revived the society for a new fairy census, 60 years on from the last one. It gathered details of as many fairy sightings from the past century as possible, and to measure the contemporary attitudes to fairies, the details of which he shares in the show. Simon briefly discusses his new title, The Boggart, Folklore, History, Place Names and Dialect, detailing the little studied and once much feared Bogart as a supernatural being from the north of England, using long forgotten sources as well as social media surveys and personal interviews. This groundbreaking book reveals that almost everything we thought we knew about the Boggart was wrong. We also discuss the Wallaton Gnomes, a famous sighting that happened in 1979 in Nottingham, England. A small group of children were wandering the park Wallaton Park, that is, early one evening, when much to their surprise they were chased by gnomes in motor cars. Certainly not your typical fairy sighting. The children said there were around 30 cars in all, with two gnomes in each car. To that end, Simon makes the point that our folklore often begins with children, a point we discuss further in the Plus Show. In the Plus Show, we discuss how cultural trends and images often become folkloric figures and create moral panic. We discuss the nightmare and fairies' strange interests in human sexuality. Simon goes into detail how fairy interactions have changed over the last 200 years, from more intense, sometimes physical encounters, to more sedate sightings. The subject of UFOs and the arguments for and against the fairy analogues come up, and we explore some interesting ideas around the men in black and the wider thematic interrelations between the phenomena. Simon goes on to describe the fairies as social beings and how they represent a distorted mirror of our own society, which provides a way we can think of ourselves outside the box. It's good stuff. I think you're going to enjoy this one. Now, if you'd like to hear the Plus Show, the simplest thing is to click the link below for our Patreon and come and join the fam. It's a price of a cup of coffee. You know the drill. Right. Let's get on with the show. Dr. Simon Young, you're very welcome to the Spirit Box. It's lovely to have you. It's great to be here, Dara. I've been a fan of your work for a long time, uh, from the, the the fairy census, the 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 Wall- the Wallaton gnomes, and um, really the the rich seam of fairy lore that you've been working on um, from an academic perspective for a long time. Um, to help orientate everybody, would you take them through kind of um, who you are on, on, on your area of, of expertise? Right, so I was originally a medievalist. Um, I studied um, the early Middle Ages in Ireland and Britain, um, and I was particularly interested in the destinies of the Irish and the British on the continent in the early Middle Ages. But about, I mean, time is marching on now, but maybe 12 years ago, I I became really quite ill, um, and I had a couple of very dicey years. Um, And I came through this, I'm glad to say, of course, I'm here today. But when I got back from being ill, I just couldn't face going back to the things I'd been studying before. And I thrashed around for a little bit in that period, looking 
consciously, semi-consciously, I'm not sure, but for something new to study. I think I'm just one of these people who needs something to study. And when I had been a teenager, I'd been fascinated by fairy law. And I remember reading the works of the great Evans Wentz, for example. And I stumbled on some English sources for that. Um, and I so I began to study the fairies and in 2012 I wrote a number of articles and from there I just really dove into to folklore and I have to say that I'm much happier looking back at my life and looking at that bad period is a kind of a blessing I, what I was studying before was interesting but I feel that a this is more interesting and b I'm better at it and so I found myself in this, let's say, general area of the supernatural folklore, fairy law. And I'm perhaps particularly interested, like many folklorists, I should say, about the point where folklore touches the anomalous or the Fortean, um, to give it that word. In other words, to what extent are these experiences just things on the page, traditions in the background, stories around the fire? And to what extent are they actually experiences that people believe, that they live, that they go through at first hand? And so perhaps that's an area that particularly fascinates me. Fantastic. And, and um, uh, one of the pieces um, uh, that, that you were behind in terms of uh, the fairy census and, and, the, and, the, and the kind of the blog behind that, um, I found it just a really interesting kind of like piece in terms of aggregate, aggregating all the the, the 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 modern experiences as well as the kind of more um, archaic and, and and kind of um uh, folkloric old folkloric uh, accounts in terms of that in terms of that work what um what surprised you the most in terms of what people volunteered don't know if surprise I don't know if I'm going to quite do justice to the word surprise but what what really struck me was the change in continuity now this phrase is a very annoying phrase that academics use that in my experience means absolutely nothing if you ever come across a book that says but 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 change in continuity you know that it's just the blandest most useless title in the world but what I found when I looked at modern fairy accounts, and this was true of Marjorie Johnson, who'd written Seeing Fairies that I helped publish in 2014, and it was true of the fairy census, was A, that with these remarkable points where you were looking at an account and you were thinking, oh my goodness, this is the same as 500 years ago, nothing new under the sun. This is remarkable. But then there were also the things that were just completely new. Um, and I'll give you an example of that, if I can. Um, I mean, the example of continuity might be, for instance, I came across a fabulous um, account from Dublin of a, I hope I remember this right, but a young man and his American girlfriend who'd gone out to the edges of Dublin and they'd seen a rolling white ball running down a hill and they thought at first that it was a plastic bag, um, but they realised it was going against the wind. And you can imagine that must have been a creepy moment. And that recalls lots of things in Irish and British folklore of accounts of rolling supernatural entities or I mean, who knows what they are, what this is. Um, so here you have these two people who didn't really have any knowledge of folklore, but were describing something that you could easily have found in a text from the 1600s. And then on the other hand, of course, there's what's new. And in some ways, that's even more fascinating because there you have all these examples where fairies appear and fairies do things that fairies just simply didn't look like or wouldn't have done even 100, 150 years ago. And the example I always trot out, even to the point where it might be a bit tedious, but it's such a useful example of fairy wings. Um, there are no accounts of people seeing with fairy fairies with fairy wings before the Great War. Um, after the Great War, there were the so-called Cottingley photographs that shows a series of fairies with wings on. But there's already been quite a lot of winged fairies in children's stories in Victorian times, and it's becoming increasingly common in art. 
Um, and in fact, you can trace that in art all the way back to the 1800s. But what happens is that after the Great War, so after 1920, 1921, the fairy accounts that we start to get begin to include wings. And if you put end to end Marjorie Johnson's various 400 plus fairy experiences, and my 500 plus fairy experiences, what you see is that fairy wings just get more common decade by decade. They enter the supernatural record. And yet, if you've gone back to Gaelic Ireland or Elizabethan England and showed someone a picture of Tinkerbell, they would be absolutely bewildered. I mean, they wouldn't know what they were looking at. I love that. That's so interesting. It, it, it makes me start to think of like, well, is the phenomena reacting to the... Um... The, the change in in cultural symbolism that we understand what 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 a fairy is um you know that's going off the deep end a bit but um it, it is quite interesting no, but it, i think th this surely is the question you've got to to ask mm -hmm. yourself and i should say straight away this isn't just with fairies it's with right. everything um, it's true of ghosts, it's true of other forms of the supernatural as well. They change over the centuries. There are these elements that sometimes remain more or less the same. Mm -hmm. um, but then there are elements that just, just go off the cliff, that change completely. Right. Um, I'll give you an example from the ghost world. Um, if you met a ghost in the 1800s in Britain or in Ireland, the chances of you meeting a ghost outside were much, much higher. Um, and the ghost that you met outside would have been very different from supernatural experiences we have today. Um, one of the most curious examples of the shape changing ghosts that you find both in Ireland and all the way through Britain, England, Scotland, Wales, where someone comes across a sheep in a road um, at two in the morning, they foolishly give the sheep a kick. The sheep suddenly turns into a horse, then turns into a black dog without a head and then blows up in a blast of flame. Um, and I mean, this has just disappeared. It's practically disappeared. You would be really hard put to find anything in Britain and Ireland after the Great War, but particularly after the Second World War, other than this very vague black dog tradition of slightly amorphous canine beings. And Dara, to go back to your point, how, how do we deal with this? Uh, if you're an ultra skeptic, if you're um, someone who just aggressively doesn't believe in the supernatural, you would say, well, this, this proves my point, doesn't it? We're just projecting the things we have in our head. If you're someone who does believe in the supernatural, I think that that means to some extent, either we're putting filters on in our own brain, and that starts to be a fascinating debate of how we see things, because if part of our supernatural experience are our personal filters, then how much can you actually trust? Well, then the other possibility is the one that you've just given. If you want to be someone who says, yes, the supernatural exists, is it possible that these entities are in some ways feeding off our views of what they should be? Um, and I, I guess the only point I'd make from this is that whichever of those three roads you go down, there is something called the social supernatural. In other words, that we seem to have some kind of influence, whatever the mechanisms are, over the supernatural experiences we have. That That's really intriguing. Um, and like when I think of, of accounts that I, I've heard and, and indeed had um, people on, on the show describe some of their experiences. I always noted um, like one curiosity for me was like, well, why is why is clothing always archaic? Why? Like with with the accounts that I've heard, I mean, given the, the volume you've heard, I'm sure, I'm sure you've got a, a, a plenty of cases that uh, are prove the opposite. But like, why is it consistently like in, in like the, the 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 appearance of like buckled shoes and pointed hats and all that kind of stuff um i mean thinking of the supernatural mm. i suppose with ghosts you could give a straightforward answer to that question that we're looking at something that is belongs to another time but with fairies where that phenomenon is really really strong it doesn't quite satisfy 
yeah. The earliest account I found, I, I know one reference from the 17th century to fairies where someone says they were wearing old clothes. And it could be that in early accounts they're wearing old clothes, but we're not sharp enough to notice that they're wearing old clothes because it, the difference between the 15th and the 16th century in terms of clothing just doesn't come out that well in words. Yeah, but it's it's fascinating. Why is that? Yeah, because um, I, I had an, an account on the show of, uh, of somebody who saw um, the Banshee who was actually following the family of a friend and while they were um, at the deathbed of that uh, the family member, um, the, the person who was, who was on the show went outside to get a breath of fresh air and, and, and saw the Banshee. Um, but interestingly, she was like, completely white. Everything was white. There was no kind of differentiating colors whatsoever. Um, and again, archaic clothing. Um, and when I think about that, I think about kind of like the, the early kind of, um, you know, the, the, the kind of punch magazine sketches and illustrations of what the, what the Banshee should look like. And it does, it, it feels the same. It feels like it's, here's the template. And this is what you think it looks like, and then you um have like there's that some some sort of like the observer and the observed having a relationship. I I wrote an article a few years ago on the arrival of fairy wings, something we've already talked about today. But one of my conclusions coming through from that article, I, I finished the, the the chapter with, was that the most important change. Um, in the way that fairies were seen came about in the end because of visual cues. There were People were just used to seeing fairies in a certain way on soap boxes, in magazines. And so in the end, this tipped over into visual experiences. And I suspect that that's true with ghosts. And I suspect it's true with most versions of the supernatural. And there you drill back. I mean, how do you start to explain this? Are we... Why are we borrowing from these established images in this way? Um, it's a difficult question, but or perhaps the mechanism is difficult. But that, that it's actually happening, I think there's no question. Um, and what you do with that, I'm not sure. Yeah, that <laughs> that is the kind of, you know, it's the cul-de-sac, right? You know, um, it, I, I'm just thinking as well, like you said, in other in other areas of the paranormal and supernatural or, or just the bizarre, like, like the the ufo airships of, of the 1800s you know um where these kind of like mechanical um you know um just oddities that almost look like so those kind of those that, that larping um area what is it called um i can't remember you know they have goggles on top hats they're kind of like um yeah. that kind of look um it seems to lend itself to that um but similarly yeah it just it just changes with the time um Anyway, we're, I'm going off on a tangent with that. Um, so in terms of, of your work, the fairy census, um, where were the hotspots in, in the UK? I think geographically speaking, when the census came out, we tried to make quite a lot of this. We said, oh, there are more sightings in Bedfordshire or, or going across to Ireland. Oh, in the Old West, in Tipperary, fairies are well represented. But really... What was perhaps remarkable was that the fairy census was pretty much everywhere in the UK and Ireland. There were results coming in from everywhere. I, I didn't have particularly the sense that I do in 19th century folklore records that there were some areas where fairy law was dead. If you're looking for fairy descriptions in the 19th century, you, you just you really struggle to find them in the home counties. And then going out from London, they slowly, slowly become more common until you get to the tip of Cornwall or the, the old Gaelic speaking strongholds in the Hebrides and there they're they're quite common and I think to some extent something similar happens in Ireland with Dublin that the further you go to the west and to the north the more likely you are to see things in the 19th century but with the fairy census people were writing in from everywhere um and the way I would interpret this is that we have what I call prior folklore, which is traditional folklore. And then we have folklore that has been let off the leash 
um, and that has come into being since the Great War, since the Second World War. And I think the fairy census is mainly about the second. It's this more modern version of, of free love folklore, a bit of a free for all in general. Uh, um, but when you were looking in the 19th century of prior folklore, these geographical differences were, were really strong. I remember making maps for fairy references in Ireland and again, Clare, Tipperary. These counties would show up really strongly, whereas when it was County Wicklow or County Dublin, you can imagine the results were much more disappointing. Um, and so that logic had broken down with the fairy census. It was much more ecumenical. Everyone was getting a go. Perhaps the hotspots, the more interesting hotspots in a way, aren't geographical at all. They're more about um, background of people, age of people, precise locations. Um, and one that always stands out for me, the one that perhaps I've fallen in love with over the years uh, since doing the, the fairy census, is a good number of references actually are from childhood experiences in bedrooms i find these really fascinating so a child is sent to bed goes to sleep or is going to sleep or wakes up early in the morning or wakes up in the middle of the night and has a supernatural experience with fairies and typically the child of course doesn't write about these but if you add 20 years 40 years they remember this vividly and then they write often a quite moving description of this fairy experience they had in the middle of the night and of course the temptation and it might be a correct temptation is just to say this was some kind of dream experience but for me where i am with the supernatural i, I don't really care if it was a dream experience or not what i'm interested in is how similar so many of these experiences are um, and perhaps the if we can start to even speculate about the reasons why these kids have these experiences yeah, it, that is that is a really interesting territory, particularly at a young age. You know, it, like is that such part of our default psychological makeup that, or are we experiencing again some sort of default archetype of some description? Um, it's it's um, yeah, particularly looking at it from from that young age, um, it, it is it is quite remarkable. I mean, what's I mean, what's your take on that? So I'm I'm a bit of a coward with these questions. I deliberately <laughs> I deliberately try not to have a take, but but simply because it, 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 I like the phrase of yours before that I've never heard used in this context. It's a cul-de-sac, mm -hmm. and you go down there and you bang your head at the air myself to give these a supernatural explanation, but at the same time I can't dismiss them. So what I try and do is just prise my head apart and keep ten percent of it open-minded. I do feel the one thing I'd go to bat for is this. First of all, the sincerity of the vast majority of people who are writing these accounts. Um, sometimes in my sceptical moments, I've even said something along these lines. I don't think I believe in fairies, but I believe people see fairies. And for me, that, that, gets, that starts to be the essence of what I perhaps really believe. In other words, I'm not sure if there's an external reality, and I would bet money that if there is that external reality is not what we want it to be. But at the same time, there's clearly something going on that's very important in our human natures and something that repeats itself across um, various cases in a patterned way. In other words, you can see the things that keep occurring in these experiences that a seven year old child just probably isn't aware of and yet is built into their experience. So I would say it's just part of our hardwiring. And I suspect that kids have been waking up in the night since the Paleolithic, um, seeing spirits of various descriptions. And I'm sure that when we launch our first spaceships off to Alpha Centauri, kids on board will be having the same experiences. This is not something that's going to go away. It's always been there. It will always be there. I, I love that. I think that's a, a fantastic take. Um, Right, in, into kind of a, a, a more specific uh, case, the the Wollaton Gnomes. This is um really fascinating. Can you can you take us through the story? Okay, this is a case. This is one of these cases that gave me a little bit of a slap in the face where I started to reconsider 
some of the ways I look at the supernatural. Though, if anything here, the slap was probably a more sceptical slap. But the basic story, um, as you will read in many Fortean sources, is this. 1979, it's... A I think a Sunday in November, I hope I've got that right. Um, and a group of kids go out for a lark, basically. They go out to mess around and they're aged between seven and 11. Um, they head off and they go to Woolerton Park, which is one of these fascinating areas that seem to attract supernatural experiences. It's a rural island surrounded by conurbation, in this case, the city of Nottingham. They go into the park, illegally it must be said, because the park was closed. And often in these kind of adolescent supernatural experiences, you have this, I find very attractive um, aspect of transgression, let's say. The kids go into the park and they then separate into two groups. The younger kids stay behind in the meadow and the older kids have a second transgression. They go over a fence into a fenced off piece of woodland. And there, I think there were three of them, or there may have been four. There's a little bit of ambiguity in our memories, or, or their memories rather, or, or our sources, let's say. And there, at one point, something seems to fall on one of the kids' backs. And then everything goes haywire. And these kids start to see gnomes and these gnomes are in cars um, and these cars are driving around and jumping over logs and going through this marshland. At this point, the kid, one of the kids, I think, falls into the mud. And here again, there's a bit of an ambiguity about the, the timing, but maybe that's what sparked the major part of this experience. And then the kids withdraw they terrify the life out of the younger kids who are waiting outside, a couple of whom burst into tears. And then they all skedaddle. And as they're skedaddling, they see around the park these gnomes in cars, apparently chasing them out. Um, this is the story as the 14 textbooks have it. Now, perhaps if we could talk about it, um, we could see where, in some ways, this description's inadequate. But th this is the basic, and this is the version of the story that say that I grew up with when I was reading these accounts. And in terms of of, of where they come up and and in, in being in, inadequate, where does the where does this the story start to kind of um, fall apart? I mean, I mean, it's a spectacular visual image. You know, it's 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 remarkable. Okay, I think you've put your finger on something there, and someone mentioned this to me the other day in a podcast as well that why is it we remember this encounter and not, frankly, the tens of others encounters, some of which include multiple children? And I think it's the visual image. It's just unforgettable. And here we come to a fascinating part of this case, and this links back to things you were saying before. For people, Dara, of your generation, I think we're probably about the same age. I'm in my 40s. For me, when I think about gnomes in cars, I immediately think, many of your listeners too, I think Noddy. Noddy and Big Ears. And Noddy and Big Ears were on television while this stuff was happening. People had T-shirts of Noddy and Big Ears. Um, there were prams going through the park that had Noddy and Big Ears decorations on. So this is the, presumably... This is where these images are coming from. Now, depending, again, where you are on the spectrum, you can explain this in different ways. Marjorie Johnson, the great fairyist who came from Nottingham and knew Woolerton Park well, said she believed that the gnomes were imitating, that she saw this as part of fairy nature to imitate things they saw. And so she speculated that maybe they'd seen some bumper cars or some kind of racing, or if she'd known about it, I'm sure she would have said, Noddy and Big Ears in their cars too. If you're at the other end and you're a super skeptic, you say either these kids are liars or this is where they're getting the images from. Um, and maybe in good faith, they've created these images, projected them in some ways. And then, of course, maybe there's a middle ground where we're seeing real supernatural things, but we've got our magic filters on. And so I, this is the way I look at these problems as to the specific issues where i started to lose 
faith. I deliberately tried to explain the story to create an image in your listeners' heads. And what I'm going to say to you now um, will put a serious point of doubt over the story. Just, just reflect for a second how you have imagined it and see what I'm going to say next does to the way you imagined it. These kids arrived in the park after dark. It was an overcast night. It had rained that day. There was not a full moon at all. There was a crescent moon, a very underdeveloped moon. They were in the fields in Woolerton Park, not in the pitch black, but with uh, streetlights at, what, 200 yards away. Very few stars, if any, in the sky. Some lights from the houses, also a couple of hundred yards away. They would have seen nothing. Then they separate into two groups and the three or four older kids go into the wooded area. This is while leaves are mainly still on the tree. So they will have gone from an area which is 85, 90% dark into an area that must have been what, 95% dark. And it was there they saw the gnomes driving around. And this is missed out of almost all the accounts. And yet when you go back and look at it, it's the thing you think, what the hell? How are they even seeing these gnomes? Now, Marjorie Johnson, who again was from Nottingham, who knew Willerton Park, did a special study of this. And she claimed in a very consistent way, she said, look, fairies are translucent. If they were gnomes in cars, you would have seen them. They would have glown in the dark effectively. One of the children talks about a light in the tree that given where we are in the park is an absolute non-starter. And this is something I've checked into. Um, and so when I used to think of this account, I had this quite romantic sense of these Nottingham scamps heading off into the park, that it was twilight. You know, they, they have this adventure, they're going through the, the, the dusk and suddenly these little gnomes appear. And then this fact just turned everything on its head for me. And I, I really have problems. I, I wonder a lot more about the account. Now, Darry, if you don't mind me throwing in, um, I recently published a book on the Woolerton gnomes um, and I was lucky enough to get all, well, several experts in areas of fairy folklore, Nottingham folklore, um, gnomes, to write mini essays. I wrote, for example, a mini essay on Enid Blyton and Noddy. And we included in this book um, all the sources that we were able to get our hands on. And for me, it was an example of how when you when you bring all the sources together and you really start looking at the data carefully, suddenly this image that you've had in your head of how things went is perhaps a little bit romanticised. And that's what I meant going back to this slap in the face. Now, the, the case has many interesting aspects. And personally, I'm a little bit more skeptical. I don't know if the kids had a supernatural experience in that dark area. My suspicion if someone held a gun to my head is that they thought they had one. Um, but as we know in the dark, various triggers can set ideas off in a very unpredictable way. And I can imagine a circumstance where someone ran out saying, I saw two gnomes in a car. And suddenly this expanded to 60 gnomes in 30 cars um, and the kids are running away with this information. But what I found really fascinating uh, on this, and I hope to write an article about this in the summer, is that clearly gnomes were part of the children's folklore in this area. The kids themselves had seen gnomes in Woolerton Park the summer before, so eight weeks before, say, in the long six week summer holidays. Um, they'd seen, they'd seen gnomes, they'd had this experience. And so this wasn't just an isolated experience. And we so often do this with the supernatural. And this is my big criticism of people usually who collect the supernatural, myself included, that we, we tend to just cut off the flower and forget about the stem and the roots. These kids had had these experiences. And then I was lucky enough to be able to gather in other experiences of kids from that epoch who also saw gnomes. Now, you could argue that this was just a result of the media attention, and it may very well be, but the fact remains that gnomes featured in the supernatural in the 70s and early 80s in that area of Nottingham among children. And, and I find that, for me, the, the most 
the, the takeaway that I most value. That's, it's so intriguing. Um, I, I just you, you mentioned that there was the the number is is staggering, so like sixteen ohms, almost like a kind of Daytona of uh, of gnomes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you're going to set me off here. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, certainly, certainly are not of no, not of notes <laughs> there. Um, one of the things that struck me going through the sources, luckily for us, the local press covered the story, but also the local headmaster did this thing. And Dara, just imagine this happening today. The poor guy would have ended up in court. But it happened on Sunday. Monday, there were rumours going around the school. So on Tuesday, he sat three of the kids down one by one and he may have sat a fourth down but we don't have that interview and he tape recorded the interview and i have here just centimeters away the tape recording of that interview that's now been written out as a transcript in that book and one of the things that i found fascinating here is that all of the kids i think mentioned 60 gnomes 30 cars there were two gnomes in each car, but that very, the very fact they agree on those numbers. Now, remember the darkness here. The sympathetic way of looking at this is to say that these kids had Monday talking with their schoolmates. And when you constantly talk about an episode that you've had, then very quickly the details start to change and start to become more consistent as well. There's a kind of secondary elaboration is that the psychological term. And, and this, this goes on. The, obviously, the nastier way to say is these kids got in a circle and agreed on all the details and played everyone from the national media um, down, to their, down to the headmaster. I have to say, not their parents. One of their parents appeared in the national newspaper to say she didn't believe a word of it. Um, <laughs> so, be, you know, it's there. But one thing I would say to any of your listeners who have supernatural experiences, I think this is a really useful bit of advice. And I've seen this through doing the fairy census. Write down your experience as quickly as you can. And then after a year, open the file, don't read it again, and write the experience again and just see if any details are changing. There are two possibilities. One possibility is you've, you've had more or less the same experience going over the year and your mind has not manipulated the details. The details have not changed. And that in itself is interesting. And it probably to some extent depends on the fact you wrote it down in the first place. The other experience is the other possibility is that you might start to see that details have changed. And this is what we all do. It's incredibly human. We do this in all areas of our lives. We tell stories. Dara, just to take an example that isn't supernatural, so the temperature hopefully will go down and all our strongly held views on this won't get in the way. But everyone listening to this will have had some kind of experience of romance in your life. And if you go back to a really important love affair you've had or the day you met your wife or et cetera, et cetera. Of course, these things just get bloated in our memory because they're so important in our life experience. And whenever that happens, you are in trouble because that's when your brain will start to manipulate the facts. And we've all had, I think, this experience. I had it just the other day when I was talking to someone about when I first met my wife and I talked to this woman at the time and she said things to me that took me back to older versions of how I'd seen what was going on. Um, and so this is a, a polite way to say human nature is extremely untrustworthy and we owe it to ourselves always to be aware of that fact i think i mean i agree wholeheartedly you know as the the father of two young children you know um their their grasp on you know who recently told um told his rugby tots coach that he was a professional rugby player you know with absolute conviction you know, and I think that's the one thing that stands out for me again and again is watching kids um, entirely believe what they're saying. And I, I think there's there's an aspect of that that never leaves people. You know, their their perspective is individual, but it is not the truth. You know, and, and 
I think it's very hard to get to the nub of any of these things, you know, which is why I kind of, you know, I really appreciate your level of investigation in, into these, into these events. Yeah, the minute I heard six year old kid, I was like, mm. <laughs> I'd be in the camp for that parent. <laughs> One thing over the years that maybe I romanticise kids a bit, but I've started to wonder over the years, and perhaps this is why I really want to write this article on the Woolerton Gnomes, but I, I wonder whether kids are not a really crucial part of the link in the folklore chain. What I mean by that is kids, I think, seem to be more open to having supernatural experiences. Now, maybe that means they really have supernatural experiences, Maybe it means they have a more play, plastic relationship to the, the truth. We could say this in any number of ways. Um, there are lots of different takes on that. But I think we more or less agree that it, children are more likely to have those experiences. And leaving aside the question of whether these are true experiences or not, my suspicion is that children are actually very important in producing new folklore. In other words, the experiences that children have then leak out into the wider community, A, because these kids are growing older, and B, because the material just spreads out. And there's an example of this that I treasure, that in the northwest of England, um, so we're talking Lancashire, Cheshire, maybe bits of Staffordshire, Derbyshire, this kind of area, parts of the old Westmoreland, there used to be a bogey called Jenny Greenteeth, Many of your listeners will know this. Many will immediately have an image pop up into their head from Brian Froude's fairies. If you're one of those people, think about the power of images um, and how that went off in your head. And Jenny Greenteeth was a way that mothers kept their kids away from dangerous places. So if there was a pond where kid could drown, you would say in 1880, Jenny Greenteeth lives there. She'll drag you in, she'll torture you, she'll eat you and she'll drown you. With time, Jenny also started to be used in other contexts. For example, Jenny lived in the abandoned mine or Jenny lived on the railway and any children who stepped on the railway. And so this is something that we can all understand. And I, I think that we have a certain amount of sympathy with those parents who were letting these eight-year-olds out at dawn and not knowing where they would be till late in the evening and just hoping they came back. What I find fascinating, having done quite a lot of work on Jenny Greenteeth, is the way that Jenny Greenteeth leaked outside that role. That she began probably as something to do with children, but we also have lots of accounts from grown people, from adults, uh, so we have the man who's terrified to walk around the hill because he once found some hidden treasure there and Jenny Greenteeth will get him if he goes back. We have the old women at Preston who saw Jenny riding on a broomstick above a well. We have a person in a Derbyshire farm who saw the ghost of Jenny Greenteeth and threw the milking stool that went right through Jenny. And so... I think maybe it's very speculative, but I suspect a lot of our folklore, a lot of our supernatural begins with children and perhaps leaks out from there. That this was it's just a guess, but I, I would love to do more work on that. Um should we talk about boggarts? Well well, let, let me talk about boggarts. I mean, just very briefly. I, I've this is some shameless self-publicity. Absolutely the, the platform for it. Absolutely the platform. <laughs> so I've just published with Exeter University Press um, a book entitled The Boggit, History, Folklore, Place Names and Dialect. And The Boggit is a British supernatural being. It's particularly associated with the northwest of England, which is give or take my home region. And it's my attempt particularly to go back and use the 19th century sources and give a total coverage to this being and show the way that folklorists have misunderstood what the boggit is. And there too, I think you have interesting reflections in supernatural law because a boggit meant in the 19th century a solitary, evil or ambivalent creature. This was a supernatural being, a spirit, it was a very general word, whereas folklorists at the end of the 19th century and in the 20th century turned it in to this really quite different being. They turned it into a house goblin, essentially. 
um, and they also paired it with brownies in a very unlikely way. But there too, the idea caught on. And it's one of these things where I think people who study folklore and the supernatural just have to accept these changes, even when they irritate them. And this is the new Boggett that's come through. But this book is above all about the old Boggett. Um, and I think that you can pick it up now from Exeter. There's a discount that gives you 30% off. Um, and if anyone wants to write to me, I can get that for you. Or you can get it on Amazon um, for about £40. So it is quite an expensive book. And it is a rather academic book. There are chapters I can imagine that will not fool people who are primarily interested in greys and sasquatch with joy for example there's a chapter on the distribution looking at various sources combining maps and place names but there were also a couple of chapters on what i call the social supernatural and first of all there's a chapter looking at the way that legends spread in small communities and then there's a great chapter though i say so myself sorry but a great because it's such fun and it's just all about the mad stuff that people used to get up to with boggets and the way that a village would convince itself that a boggit was on the loose. And then people would have these various visions of boggets. And I would say to anyone who's interested in more but doesn't feel like shelling out 50 quid, if you go on YouTube and look for my name and the word boggets, I've now given a couple of Zoom talks in association with the book. And so that might be a place to learn a bit more and get more a sense of what's going on in that book. There is also associated with this a second book on the Boggets, just with Boggett sources, and this is free to download. Um, and you, you just need to go, you can buy it as a print on demand book for 50 pounds, but if I were you, I would just go to my academia page and download it from there for free or to the Exeter page and download it from there free. Um, and then this would be something that you could look through. There are lots of 19th century accounts brought together there. Phenomenal. So uh, I will make sure to kind of aggregate all those and get them in the show notes. And then um, given that we're a, we're a, we're a podcast here and uh, all the listeners are, are fans of, uh, of that medium, um, you got your own show as well. So this is something that we've been doing for the last nine months or so. I have a dear colleague, an American colleague called Chris Woodyard, who some of your listeners will be familiar with. And Chris has written over the years, particularly on the 19th century supernatural. And that's where perhaps she and I, our interests coincide. And essentially we pick a supernatural case, say the Woolerton Gnomes, and we do it once a month. And we then argue our way through the show. I think I'm a little bit more skeptical than Chris. Chris is um, not quite as sceptical, I would say. I'm a bit more manic. Chris is wiser and slower. <laughs> um, she's a little bit older than me. Uh, I'm again, I'm, I'm not, we're not quite the same age, but she's got this wonderful American accent um, and I have the accent that you're listening to. And so all these contrasts um, make up for me quite an interesting show. Um, and it's a show that's based very much on the idea that disagreements make the world go round. that right. by not necessarily seeing eye to eye, both people at the end see further. And one of the things I've learned doing these shows with Chris is that I try not to write too much on the subject before I talk to Chris for an hour, because I almost always change my mind by the end of the show. In other words, it's partly what Chris is saying, partly me just trying to disagree with Chris, but seeing where that in some respects she's right. And so we would be very, very happy, clearly, if any of your listeners wanted to give us a try. Definitely. Again, that'll be in the show notes for everybody. Um, Simon, it's been absolutely fantastic chatting to you. The time has flown by. I've really, really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, that's been, that's been great. I enjoy that an awful lot. I've, I've had a brilliant time too thanks so much and i hope i can come back on sooner oh, definitely, or later definitely yeah. um, great we'll uh, we'll wrap it up stuff i really enjoy that and 
there were so many there's so many interesting avenues to explore and it was a real pleasure to have um dr young on the show now if you'd like to find out more about his work do check the show notes there's an extensive list of the relevant links there right that is it from me i'm dara mason and you've been listening to the spirit box take care talk soon